Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, and again, uh, today I'm uh, uh, in celebration of Nick's birthday. We'll talk about um, how the uh, 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 work in the development of the visible light emitting diode ultimately led from that contribution and actually many more contributions from Nick as well as his students um, to today's large scale photonic integrated circuits. And uh, I wanted to start the talk with this quote from Nick. Uh, and actually he, uh, I forget what seminar he was at, but he, he actually, I wrote this down when he said it. Uh, and it's basically ideas don't come out of nowhere. They come from hard work and building on the work of others. And uh, if there's any reason why you should uh, be a, a student of the history of the field, I think this is it. Um, if you talk to many of the VCs in the Valley, what they will tell you is that how innovation happens is by taking a new idea and applying it to an old idea. And often those old ideas are not well known or remembered. And it's the combination of those two that really leads to innovation. And so if, if, uh, being a student of the history and understanding what it has taken to go from a visible LED back in 1962 to large scale photonic integrated circuits, um, hopefully we'll provide some groundwork so you can see how the field developed as well as you can maybe potentially be the uh, a framework for also continuing the field as well. Um, so uh, 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 the last thing I want to say is that um, with all the innovations uh, from Nick and his students, we truly are standing on the shoulders of giants and uh, I'm honored to be here and the contributions at Infanera uh, are indebted to these contributions that Nick and his students have made to the field. So where, where did this all begin? Uh, from my perspective, it began with the uh, invention of the transistor uh, by uh, John Bardeen and uh, as uh, Russ and Dennis and, uh, have talked about, uh, it was also the discovery of minority carrier injection, this discovery of the whole the basis for the PN junction um, and ultimately is the basis for the semiconductor industry as we know it today. Um, on top of this, for optoelectronics and photonic integrated circuits, um, a seminal foundation has been the development of this first visible LED, the alloy diode laser, in the alloy diode laser. And really what this has showed where the conventional wisdom of the world was that alloys were too riddled with defects at the time to be useful, was that truly the 3-5 alloy was viable. And the viability of this alloy opened up the whole world of being able to use tunable band gaps to be able to make very sophisticated devices. And in fact, all optoelectronic devices and photonic ICs that we know today use the alloy. On top of this, and as Russ talked about, uh, the vapor phase epitaxy originated uh, for the alloy, originated with the uh, work of Nick. And uh, that work culminated, uh, ultimately led to uh, uh, from closed tube to open tube to MOCVD, uh, which is really the workhorse technology that is used today for all photonic integrated circuits. Okay. So this slide uh, highlighting the transistor in Nick's work on the 3.5 alloy shows also a few of what I consider the other foundational uh, uh, work that has led, that's been the basis for modern optoelectronics and photonic ICs. Um, and uh, I'm gonna walk through just a couple of these here. Um, but one uh, is clearly the integrated circuit. And this was developed in the late 50s and early 60s by Kilby and Noyce. Um, and as uh, this is a quote from Bob Noyce, but really the, the essence of the integrated circuit is that as, uh, as things get smaller, everything gets better. Less power, faster, more reliable, lower cost. Um, and that's really what, photon what, what integration brings uh, and how it has built the semiconductor industry. In the late 60s, Stuart Miller proposed to take that same concept and apply it to photonics. Um, and you can see here in this paper 
uh, that he proposed to uh, using photolithography techniques to be able to make the same analogs in photonics. Um, and then he ended, uh, then he made in the statement one key statement, if realized, economy should result. And that was actually a really important statement at the time because if realized, uh, and he's saying that he was highlighting that there were still a lot of work yet to be done. And there were, there are marked differences between photonic ICs and electronic ICs that really um, uh, led to the need for that. And some of these are uh, that photonic ICs require a much more diverse set of materials. Um, the building blocks, so lasers, modulators, detectors, waveguides, there's a much more complex and diverse set of building blocks that are needed for photonic ICs. The applications in circuits um, for photonic ICs uh, have been and are less scalable, meaning you don't have a step and repeat effective digital block that are used to build the circuits. Also, the fundamental photonic size limit is much greater than the electronic size limit, obviously, so that has led to that you don't get the same uh, benefits or ability to scale devices geometrically. And also, progressively, complex and sizable applications have been slower to emerge. And what that has meant is that there's been less reinvestment in the industry to fuel that development. So all of these made it more difficult for the development of photonic ICs. So what was needed was, uh, beyond what existed for electronic ICs, was to first develop a full suite of process technology to address these issues. And uh, this is uh, what I consider to be um, some of the key processes that were needed beyond what existed in electronic ICs to develop photonic ICs. And I'm not going to run through every single one of these, but what I want to highlight in red, these are the developments that Nick and his students made directly uh, on these processes. And in blue are developments that his students made uh, after leaving the lab. So if you look at the totality of what was required to make photonic integrated circuits, it absolutely starts with Nick and his fingerprints are all over it uh, for decades to come after that. So I'm going to talk about a couple of these key uh, processes that Nick was involved in developing uh, as well as his students. So the first, as we talked about, was vapor phase epitaxy. Um, th this is shown here in uh, some of the early publications and patents. Uh, and uh, this was adopted to open tube uh, technology by Monsanto uh, in the mid to late 60s. Um, and uh, this has ultimately been an essential growth technique for all 3-5 semiconductors and heterostructures. And as Russ talked about, uh, it was extended to metal organics and that really gave us the ability to grow high-quality aluminum-based alloys, ultra-thin quantum layers, uh, and to have very precise nanometer thickness composition and strain control. Uh, and to do this in a very high-throughput, low-cost way. So you can see Nick's crystal back from 1963. And you can see you know, here's a, another example of one of the MOVPE reactors. So this literally grows on square feet of material at a time. Another key uh, technology process that needed to be developed was uh, uh, how to get light in and out of the crystal. Uh, and this, uh, in 1962, Nick worked on cleaved cavities for laser diodes. Uh, and actually today we use that same technology for how do we get light in and out of the 3.5 photonic integrated circuits. Russ also talked about the importance of the quaternary. Uh, the quaternary is uh, very important because it gives us the ability to truly tune over the, uh, the spectrum of band gaps that are needed uh, to make the whole variety of devices. And the first quaternary, uh, the viability of the quaternary and quaternary laser diodes was first shown in Nick's lab. And this is Burke's work was done uh, in 1971. And the quaternary, especially for photonic integrated circuits, is important because it allows us to access the low loss, low dispersion uh, regime of the fiber. 
And uh, that quaternary is indium gallium arsenide phosphide. And uh, one of Nick's students, Sean Rossi, after graduating, went to Lincoln Labs, and that's where they first demonstrated the viability of the indium gallium arsenide phosphide. So this was the first CW room temperature uh, devices operating in the low loss, low dispersion spectral regime. After we had a suite of processes, what was still needed was having the individual devices or building blocks to make the photonic integrated circuit. So over the next 30 to 40 years, uh, the industry then went ahead and developed those building blocks. And I'll just run through some of the key ones here quickly. Um, so photodetectors uh, were first uh, developed in the late 50s with uh, key uh, improvements being made in the 70s all the way out to the 80s where we ultimately developed waveguide high-speed photodetectors. Um, distributed feedback lasers were proposed in the early 70s. Um, Don Cyphers, Bob Burnham, in uh, William, William Streifer first demonstrated the first DFB injection laser uh, in the, in the mid-70s. Uh, quantum well injection lasers were first realized by Nick uh, in the late 70s, and quantum well MOVPE lasers were first realized by work with Russ and Nick uh, in the late 70s. Uh, strained band gap engineering was demonstrated in the mid 80s, um, and modulator technology started in the early 60s, but uh, developments continued throughout the 80s. Um, optical multiplexers and demultiplexers were developed in the late 80s and early 90s. And then Dennis talked about the Vixel technologies, and I include these for photonic ICs. They, they are photonic ICs, but I'm not going to focus on them on the talk today, but I've included them here for completeness. So you can see this is, uh, it took a range of 30 or 40 years to develop a complete set of building blocks. Um, and again, uh, like the process technology, Nick and his students Fingerprints are all over this work as well. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the selected building blocks. As I said, the first DFB injection lasers uh, were realized by Xerox by uh, Cypherson and team. And distributed feedback lasers are important because they gave us the ability to integrate mirrors within the photonic integrated circuit. Uh, also have single frequency devices, and these are critical for long distance transmission and performance and low noise. Uh, quantum well lasers were first developed by Nick, and they're first developed using LPE. Uh, and this was done here in University of Illinois. And they really, quantum well lasers enable uh, dramatic reduction in threshold and reduced temperature sensitivity. So this gives us high, higher output power and low power dissipation. Uh, the work, this work was extended to uh, be to MOVPE uh, by Russ, and uh, who worked with Nick to demonstrate that this could be done, uh, quantum wells could be done with MOVPE. And this was really important because you can combine now the advantages of MOVPE with the advantages of quantum wells. Another important uh, advance was the development of strained layer quantum wells. Um, and this was done by one of Nick's students, Win Ladick, um, after he graduated. And uh, what strained quantum wells provide is even enhanced performance beyond quantum wells, for both for power, output power and dissipated power, um, improved reliability, and also additional ability to access additional compositions and band gaps. John Rossi, uh, Charlie Wolf, and John uh, uh, and Greg Stillman all made contributions to electroabsorption modulators and detectors and waveguides as well. And these were key, key uh, developments uh, for building blocks for photonic ICs. So now we had a suite of building blocks in the early 90s that were developed, and so the industry was primed to be able to start to use photonic ICs. And the killer application that first developed was optical communications. Uh, optical communications is a natural market for photonic ICs because if you look, it has 
an exponential need to scale bandwidth and an exponential need to reduce cost. And the only technology that has existed to do that decade upon decade really has been semiconductor technology. So photonic ICs and optical communications are a perfect match. So uh, the, begin the first uh, photonic ICs were indium phosphide based as they were targeting the low loss regime of the fiber. Uh, and they consisted of a laser integrated with an electroabsorption modulator, so two devices. And these devices were first commercially introduced in 1996. They operated at uh, two and a half gigabits per second. Uh, later, uh, uh, devices were developed that provided widely tunable lasers, so tunable across 40 nanometers or the full C-band spectrum of the fiber. Uh, but these devices integrated four or five elements. And so these ultimately developments took us up to a regime where the bandwidth scaled to about 10 gigabits per second. What I'm going to talk about now in the rest of the talk is using large scale photonic integration to scale to 100, 500, and multi terabits per second using system on chip photonic integrated circuits. And with, these, with this technology, photonic integrated circuit technology, we've been able to continue the exponential increase in bandwidth. So doubling the bandwidth on a commercial chip about every 2.2 years. So to do this, we've had to go from integrating four or five devices on a single chip to 50 or 60 for the first 100 gigabit per second devices, and now to over 400 devices on a single chip. Uh, we actually have demonstrations in the research lab of over 1,700 functions on a single chip. So we're actually more in limited today by not the capability to integrate, but by other considerations. The first uh, uh, full system on chip photonic integrated circuits were developed in 2004. These consisted of 100 gigabit per second transmitters and receivers. Um, so 10 channels operating at 10 gigabits uh, on a single chip. And so you can see there's an array of uh, DFB lasers, an array of electroabsorption modulators, uh, amplifiers, attenuators, and multiplexer. You can see a picture of the chip. This is the transmitter chip. This is the receiver chip. Um, so with this, we replace over 100 fiber couplings and 20 to 40 gold boxes. Uh, these were the first fully integrated uh, commercial system on chips, and it enabled for the first time that we could realize the advantages, uh, similar to the advantages in electronic integration uh, within the optical communications networking gear. The demand for bandwidth drove a need to go beyond 10 gigabits per second. To do that, the industry moved from on-off keying to coherent modulation. However, one of the problems with coherent modulation is that it takes four times the number of functions as on-off keying. So that makes photonic integration a natural home for coherent modulation. And with that, in Infinera, we developed 500 gigabit per second coherent transmitters and receivers. So again, 10 distributed feedback lasers, uh, 10, actually 20 uh, IQ modulators, uh, two polarization, one for each polarization per channel, and two arrayed waveguides on a single chip. Uh, similarly, a heterodyne receiver feeding an AWG that demultiplexes the signal, mixes it with a d distributed feedback laser as a local oscillator, feeding a pairs of balanced photodetectors. Uh, these were the first fully integrated coherent transmitter and fully integrated coherent receivers. They were also the first multi-channel coherent transmitters and receivers. Um, and it was also the first time that a mock sender modulator, an indium phosphide mock sender modulator, was used for coherent modulation. Um, there, uh, it's beyond the scope of this talk, but uh, there were significant questions whether indium phosphide would have sufficient linear characteristics to be used for coherent modulation. These devices are packaged in some of the most sophisticated uh, uh, optical packages at the time. 
Uh, the I.O. count of the packages is uh, over 1,000. Uh, some other key things, there's 40 high-speed streams that feed uh, the modulator driver and the amplifiers. Uh, the photonic integrated circuits re require additional controls, so there's a 300 function control ASIC uh, hybrid integrated within these modules. And to interconnect all these hybrid modules, there's 24 feet of wire bonds. Um, so a real tour de force of optical packaging for these devices. More recently, we've developed widely tunable lasers and integrated them into the photonic integrated circuit platform. And so what you see here are multi-channel picks incorporating widely tunable lasers. Um, and these operate not just with quadrature phase shift keying, but also 16 QAM. And as a result, we can at 33 gigabaud get 200, gigabit, 200 gigabits per wave, per channel. So that each pick has a total capacity of 1.2 terabits. Um, these were the first fully integrated commercial coherent transmitters and receivers with widely tunable lasers. They still are the only commercial coherent devices with widely tunable lasers that are fully integrated. They're the first multi-channel widely tunable laser photonic ICs as well. And uh, here again you see what we've done is integrated these uh, photonic ICs now into a transceiver platform, some more packaging as to what I discussed before. And in this movie you can see uh, this is real data that uh, each laser is tunable across the full extended C-band. So over a period of 12 years, we went in 2004 from having discrete 10 gigabit per second devices um, into uh, 2016, an improvement of 240x in bandwidth. Um, and now more recently, we've developed devices operating at 600 gigabits per channel. Uh, and uh, these are, I'm going to describe some modules with four channels operating at 600 gigabits per channel. And to do that, we've increased the baud rate to 69 gigabaud and we're using 64 QAM modulation. So a key aspect of doing that is uh, the interconnect technology, the high-speed interconnect technology in the hybrid module. So I talked before about having 24 feet of wire bonds, and this is an, a closer view of those 24 feet of wire bonds within a transmitter module. What we've developed at Infinera is a technology for flip chip interconnects, and that flip chip interconnect is key to being able to move from 33 gigabaud to 100 plus gigabaud. So we have a technology now where we are integrating a modulator driver in very close proximity to a transmitter photonic integrated circuit in this case. Um, there's a thousand interconnects between this modulator driver and the PIC and the interposer that it sits on. No wire bonds, they're completely gone. Um, and this is a commercial technology, meaning it's passed all of the reliability, uh, elevated stress testing, um, so it's a robust and scalable technology. And so this is the first integrated circuit 3.5 flip, flip chip technology that we're aware of, not just for photonics, but for electronics as well. And what this enables us is the ability to, ma to make very high speed devices, so this shows that uh, 3 dB bandwidth for a combined pick and modulator driver in excess of 50 gigahertz. And it, that high speed capability has enabled us to build these 600 gigabit per wave devices. So these are four channel transmit and receive picks. So you can see the modules built here. These are coupled to a real time DSP processing ASIC. Um, and this shows four channels operating at 600 gigabits per wave, error free. In addition, these utilize uh, improved widely tunable lasers. And the, the widely tunable lasers on the receiver in this case are operating at less than 40 kilohertz line width. And this is a record line width for a, uh, a, a semiconductor laser as far as we're aware, for, for a monolithic semiconductor laser. There's external cavity devices that have narrow line, uh, narrower line width, but not for a, an integrated device. 
In addition, this technology is capable of scaling to even higher bandwidths. So with this, we've actually demonstrated the first terabit uh, performance out of a uh, indium phosphide components. So this is 100 gigabits operating at 32 quam. Uh, we also have uh, 100 gigabaud 16 quam over 1400 kilometers. And again, this is using multi-channel PICs and this uh, flip chip integration platform. So, uh, and as uh, uh, Dennis talked about, uh, we're not done. There's still a lot, much to do. There's still, uh, uh, there's still a need for even more bandwidth. Um, and so uh, what's going to happen in the next 10 years? I don't have a perfect crystal ball, but uh, uh, people are going to need more bandwidth. And a big place that is driving this are video uh, and display applications. And just to give some idea, it's not just the display application itself, but it's how we use that today. So. Um, you may not be aware of it, but when you have your cell phone and you travel from the United States, from Los Angeles to Boston, well, Facebook is smart enough to know, to sense that you've moved from Los Angeles to Boston. So guess what it does? It takes your data in a data center near Los Angeles and moves it all the way to Boston because you want to be able to have that data available, and video data especially has to move because of how much bandwidth is associated, otherwise there's too much latency. So it's not just the video or the display itself, but it's moving that around so that it's available real time. So uh, bandwidth will continue to increase and as, as we use more and more video, as displays become more and more integrated into our lives. In addition, one of the key things that's gonna require, especially in this mobile connected world, is that we drive the power down. And we're gonna to have to drive the power down not by factors of 10% and 20%, but we're gonna to have to drive the power down by 10X or more. And photonic integration is gonna be key to this, but we, it's also gonna be key that we work on new frontiers. And with that, I am still, uh, I believe that some of the things that uh, Nick and Milton have been doing more recently on the lighting, light emitting transistor uh, are important future directions. Um, we really are going to, if we're going to have lower power, we have to figure out how to get electronics and photonics even integrated even more intimately. Um, and we really have to figure out how do we continue to drive the scale and drive down the scale of the devices. So I'm not sure if we're going to, you know, what will be the ultimate embodiment, but these key problems need to be solved. And this is a technology that's starting to look at how do you solve some of those things. So, uh, in conclusion, I want to uh, thank Nick and uh, celebrate his birthday. Before Nick, there was no 3.5 alloy light emitter. Uh, and after Nick, we are blessed with a, a rich field of optoelectronics and photonic ICs that really have been built upon his work and the work of his students. So, I want to thank him for his many decades of contributions, his mentorship, friendship, and guidance. <laughs>